three, two, one, and we are live. Hi, everybody. I am joined by this incredible cohort of American theater voices. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, so a couple of you viewers have asked about writing for comedy specifically, how you do it, how you know if it's funny to anyone besides yourself, how you develop it, um, all the things. So I thought of the funniest plays that I've seen and read in the last years, and they are written by the people gathered here. So thanks everybody for all of you for, for joining and sharing your wisdom. Um, I'll just start introducing myself and share some pronouns and throw it to each of you since we don't know what order you're sitting in on my Zoom <laughs> setup. We'll just do that and then I'll get started. So Lauren Gunderson, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Jonathan, would you go next? Oh, of course. Uh, Jonathan Spector, he him. <laughs> Larissa, how will you go? Hey, Larissa Fastor, she, her, hers. Tori, would you go? Tori Sampson, she, her, hers. And Mike? Uh, Mike Blue, he, he, his, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. <laughs> and Leah. <laughs> Leah Nanaka Winkler, she, her, her. Hey, all right, awesome. So um, I would love to, uh, since there's a lot of us, I'll be doing the like calling on you as, you know, at, like we were in an elementary school or something. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I think what's so exciting about what all of you have done is write excellent theater that is really, really funny. And you can do both of those things separately, but you, all of you did them together. Um, and for some of you, I know, say for like Larissa, your work doesn't always land in hilarious. You write a lot of different kinds of, of plays, um, but your play, Thanksgiving play, was absolutely breathtakingly funny, poignant, political. Um, would you maybe start and talk about how you come, came to write that and just how the comedy came to be in that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, hmm. you know, it's funny because people didn't actually know me as a human and not a playwright um, just assume I would be writing comedy, that that's what I do. That um, my friends, you know, I could tell the people that have known me a long time that came to the show were like, oh my God, it's just you talking in four voices. You know, like that's just, I'm, I will do any, as another friend said, I'll do anything for the joke, like in my life. So, um, so it's interesting that in theater and in my other writing, um, I think because I write primarily in the Native American world, uh, non-Native American people have such a, you know, dramatic view of Indians. And so uh, I get asked to write a lot of dramatic, difficult, dark, horrible things, um, a lot of history, which is mostly bad. And, uh, you know, when I got to this play, this was one of my very few plays I've written. I've only done two that weren't commissioned. So I was like, great, now I can finally just do something that I want to do. Um, Native people, uh, humor comes first. I, you know, you laugh or you cry. And um, so most people choose to laugh. And so, I mean, you can't get together with Indians more than two minutes and they're all just in hysterics. You know, I mean, the jokes are ridiculous and it's constant. So I, I think it, it's just the most natural way to express indigenous issues. Um, so that's where it came from, just being the natural way to do it. it it's tricky because it's a satire. Uh, I always say it's a comedy in a satire. So Thanksgiving play is a satire, but I put a comedy inside of it, which I call the sugar to help the medicine go down. Because um, I want it to be fun. I want us to have a great time. And I want people to laugh and enjoy themselves in the theater. That's the best thing about theater. It's seeing, I mean, when you sit in a room full of people, like the first time I was sitting in, um, uh, it was actually when I was in New York. And I remember the first time I was in with an audience and there's this joke at the very beginning that I call the unifying joke because some of my jokes are specifically for the native audience and some are for non-native folks. And so there's this joke called the unifying joke that happens in the first three minutes to make, bring everybody together. We all know it's safe to laugh. And um, when that, the first time I hit that with an audience and I heard the entire, like every single person lose it at the same time. It's like, oh, that's the best feeling in the world. There's nothing funner than that, not just as a writer, but as an audience member. And I love creating that. So I'd love to be doing only comedies. I just can't get people to hire me to do them. I mean, maybe I, that will be our goal for the yeah. post pandemic is to get Larissa writing comedies all the time. I'm I mean, I will so say happy. just for, to like dive into a practical, if it's a comedy, you have to laugh early, right? If you wait for like, if it's minute 10 in your comedy before you get that big laugh, they're not gonna ever get a big laugh again. No, and show, actually so. I have several jokes before the three minute mark. <laughs> the three yeah. minute mark is the one that lets everybody know 
this is for, it's safe for all of us to laugh and we can all laugh together as one and it doesn't pit the audience against each other because some of my work does intentionally pit the audience against each other. But this is like that three minute joke is the one that says, hey everybody, this is for all of you. It's a low, it's low hanging fruit. Um, we're all in this game together. Yeah, that's great. Tori, can you talk a little bit about um, If Pretty Hurts or any of your other plays and kind of how you tap into that voice of comedy? Do you use it? How do you set it up? How do you tell the audience to laugh? Kind of how, how does how does comedy work in, in your voice as you're writing? Yeah, sure. I mean, I see myself as like a comedic, like sociopolitical writer. And I grew up on a lot of like satirical political television. So like I loved um, watching All in the Family as a kid, um, uh, Three's Company, uh, different strokes like shows where like you would have like innately the, the the setup of the show was like about politics and and the characters and their engagements with each other they're always going to be struggling with like um race politics gender politics things like that and so and then with satire it's like if you just force yourself to be brutally honest it cuts through the idea of like where's the joke that is actually the joke it's like oh i'm just actually just going to say how it is and i think that for pretty hurt that was pretty easy it was just like okay just like take all of the the politics like the pc culture out of beauty and how we talk about beauty and just like speak about it in ways that we talk about with our friends when nobody's looking or in the mirror you know like even like go deeper to when the things you don't tell your friends um and just like say it on stage and so i for me like i i don't feel like i necessarily am like okay where's the joke in this i'm like okay if you just cut the bullshit it'll be funny and I kind of just like let that instinct just roll and just like it's ingrained in me of like um watching those comedies and growing up and learning storytelling through like um sitcoms like and and sitcoms that did that were really tackling social issues and not and like really balancing that entertainment and like you know wrapping it up in 30 minutes and like making people feel like they want to come back for more which is something as like a playwright I kind of struggle with with like the wrapping it up portion of it. I don't always agree with that but um just like just learning that skill set really and then letting the instinct of like what it means to like be a black woman in America it's like I have to make a lot of things like Larissa's saying you have to find the humor like it's embedded in my culture to like find find the humor in tough things um, and I kind of just really rely on what comes naturally to me. And then I let my training come in afterwards. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. That's yeah. I, I totally resonate with that, 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 um, idea that the, what's brutally honest is kind of shocking and shocking is disarming and disarming is, yeah. is part of what's funny. Um, yeah. Now, Mike, um, can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, all of your plays I find, <laughs> hilarious but I think people would probably most know you at least recently from Teenage Dick and would you talk about that and I mean there's Shakespeare at the kind of core of that but then it's totally you um how do you how do you roll in it how, how do you find your funny or do you even think about it um I I feel like uh I most of the stuff that I write is comedy so it's hard for me to like um uh like I yeah I can't I get itchy with drama <laughs> like so um, if anything, uh, if the sort of baseline is comedy, I think that like, uh, I think a lot about how to like get people on board, like uh, Larissa was saying about sort of this universal laughter. But for me, it's like, um, I feel like a lot of theater is, uh, has trained us to like um, take things in in a really naturalistic way. So I think that like out mm -hmm. front, I try to push really hard on the jokes and on um, uh, getting people on board that like, okay, can we all accept that this is, the, the reality of the situation like okay can now can I stretch you a little bit farther so that like where we land is like in a place that's a little bit more absurd and a little bit looser um and so that like our kind of starting precepts are farther along than like um normal theater will allow for <laughs> <laughs> yeah absurdism like how how do you create something that's like strange and wild to begin with yeah because I feel like even with like theater training that like actors are like I'm going to like naturalism this for you. And it's like, no, please don't like, and um, so I think there's a lot about like teaching both like your collaborators and the audience about like what the rhythms of this world will be. And like what um, sort of like, let's all like go through the kind of standard jokes until we get it like the real laugh and not like try to milk every, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like, 
it's almost a lot like about a musicality of comedy like uh and trying to get people onto my particular tune god it's always rhythm and yes um leah would you tell us about some of your work i mean I mean, the play that that I was so struck by that my friend Lily Tongue Crystal directed here in the Bay Area was, oh God, the audience was like not, it was like, it was so funny that you like couldn't, you almost couldn't hear the next line where it was like, all right, everyone, yes, it's funny. Shh. <laughs> um, would you tell us about how um, that play came? I, yeah, just talk about your your process, comedy. Do you think about comedy? I mean, even your naturalistic plays, and one of which I saw at Humana was, um, how, there's so much funny to it. It's a different kind of funny than that felt more heightened and everything. But would you talk about some of how you come to comedy? Yeah, um, I, I think for me, I do tend to write in two different realms or I've noticed that about myself. Uh, I don't do it intentionally, but the first realm I write in is deeply personal. And I think like Tori was saying, like anytime you're honest with yourself, mainly like even if you're not expecting things to be funny it's just funny like a lot of the time I'll just like whenever I'm writing a, a play inspired by some like personal event like uh, God said this or Kentucky which could be viewed as semi-autobiographical I tend to look at my notebooks from the era where I was experiencing that a traumatic event and whenever I'm like free writing those traumatic events, like I'm like crying and like, it's so awful. But then whenever I look back at him like a year later, I'm like, oh my God, this is hilarious. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so like, I, I think a lot of my humor definitely comes through in honesty, not trying too hard to construct a joke. Um, whenever I'm approaching satire, I'm deeply fascinated by patterns of behavior uh, collectively as a society and things that we are told that are good and deeply examining how uh, privilege and um, just a bunch of hokey shit gets conflated with like works of genius or things that everybody does. And it's not necessarily that I'm like mad about it, but I like examining that through fum uh, humor and the only place that I can really like openly make fun of it uh, while trying to figure out, you know, why I'm being told that this is the way I should live is to write about it from a humorous standpoint. Uh, and that's how a lot of my satirical plays like Two Mile Hollow, um, which is a play that satirizes the white people by the water genre, uh, where people of color just play white people in a big house by the water um, uh, came to be because I think like in 20, it was like a different time back then. I think it was like 2012. Like we noticed that um, a lot of plays by a certain theater company in New York uh, and we can't like, I can't say what it is because it was Manhattan Theater Club did uh, like seven white people by the water plays in one season. <laughs> and like we were all looking at it being like, what the fuck this is the same play like 18 times and but but you know on like a deeper level I start just started thinking about like why that was producible and hmm. um and, and like why like and how long I've been told as you know a person who moved to America as a child and who's biracial who came from I don't know like humble beginnings that this is like the ideal art form so I, I think that theater is a unique place to do that in TV and film, you know, like uh, I've also done comedy writing in that realm. It's like you have like the five point sketch structure or you submit jokes for a packet and that that's like a math problem almost. But with theater is so free, like you can just blah and then sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's not. That's usually how I approach comedy and theater. That's awesome. Um, okay, so Jonathan, what's your what's your space? So uh, Eureka Day is your probably most famous place certainly at the moment, wildly popular um, in New York and award winning and all that fun stuff. But it's so uh, crisply funny taking down, frankly, the part of the air, the world where you and I are 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 from in the Bay Area. How did you come to write? But I mean, I I've known you writing for a long time, and there's always this kind of wild humor to it. Um, how do you how do you do what you do? Or what, what was that play? How, how'd, how'd that one come about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't, 
uh, I mean, I'm, I think I when I'm writing, I I don't think too much about. I mean, I'm always trying to amuse myself first in the writing, and so I, um, you know, and and hopefully it, it's sort of trying to tackle something bigger than just being funny. But I feel like then I don't understand, like I don't really understand how the comedy works until I am in a room with actors or, and even more in a, with, with an audience of some kind. Like um, it's always surprising to me, like which, even if there's a lot of stuff that I think is amusing or funny, like why one joke is much, you know, gets a much bigger response than another. I, I don't understand that until I see it with an audience and then you can sort of, um, you know, begin to unpack it. But I feel like, um, yeah, there, there's something sort of uh, mysterious about about it in a way. Uh, I mean, in Eureka Day being sort of most extreme example I've ever had of that, where the first the first preview of the first production, there's there's sort of a big scene where um, sort of people in a room are having this meeting that's being streamed on Facebook Live, and then you see these comments. And all through the rehearsal process, all we were wondering is like, is anybody gonna read those comments? Are they just gonna kind of ignore them? And can they still track the play if they're ignoring them? And, um, and then at that first preview, like the audience was so responsive that you couldn't hear, you know, half the scene. And, you know, all of the production team, we were all just sort of looking around at each other, like, what, what is happening? Because none of us sort of were anticipating that. And, and, uh, and then of course you start to be able to sort of shape it and move from there, but I, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's one of the wonderful things about about writing things that are comedic is it's it's just the most intense way of feeling like this is a form that only really exists like, with live people in the room and that you can only really understand that way. And then you can begin to sculpt it um, and it, and sort of try and I mean, sort of like Mike was saying, you can try and sort of like build the rhythm of those. Um, you know, like the, the way a scene builds, so that you know you can feel when there's like a missing sort of step here to get to the sort of the way the place you want it to peak with the comedy in a moment but but I feel like that work at least for me I can only really do once there are sort of other other humans. I'd love to talk about how all of you have worked or the best versions of relationships with directors and actors during a process of creating a comedy because that's the alchemy of that is so delicate and necessary um, but it also occurs to me kind of thinking about all the the plays that one tenant that I, I certainly use when approaching comedy is that if you write where the the characters know that they're funny, it's not very funny. But if the characters the characters must think that they are in a very serious drama <laughs> for it to be funny at all, the audience can laugh. But if the characters kind of are in on it, <laughs> it's suddenly like. <laughs> um, but so that and that's kind of a case for intensity and passion in the characters. And, and it also seems that all of these plays are political. I mean, inherently, I think the funniest plays are political. The ones that aren't are kind of charming or can be silly and enjoyable, but the ones that deal with it are saying something bigger, but using comedy as a magnifying glass to get close to it um, and to relax people around you as, as Larissa, you were saying, make the medicine go down. If you're like, everybody having a good time, great. Now learn your shit, <laughs> come on in closer. Um, how do you, how, how does anybody kind of respond to, to, to that? Larissa, maybe let's go back to you in terms of the idea of talking, using comedy for, for politics and using comedy for that kind of question of, of social change and social justice. Yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely, um, it's just funner. I, I personally, I mean, there's lots of fantastic plays that are really tough and hard on you as an audience. I, I don't go to the, I don't go to them. <laughs> Unless, unless they're a really, really good friend, I can't get out of it, and or it's opening night and I'm stuck. Um, I just, I don't like it. I don't like going and having people preach at me for an hour and a half or two hours. I just don't. I, I and even if I'm wrong, I still, you know, if I'm right, either way, I just, I don't want it. I'm not interested. Um, it's not what I go to theater for. And um, so now everyone knows why I didn't show up to your play in the past year. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, so if I know you're going to be like teaching me stuff and telling me stuff and changing me overtly, I, I'm just not going to go. So that that's the number one reason <laughs> to get me to go to my own place um, and get my friends to go to my place. Uh, you know, I was also thinking, you know, because uh, both because Mike and I um, worked with the same director, um, Maris von Stupenagel, on uh, in New York recently on Thanksgiving play and. Um, and, and all, like all of your plays practically, I think. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I was just thinking about um, 
the room and what you're, you know, just now when you're saying that is like, it, that is imperative though. Like I, I've done a lot of productions of the Thanksgiving play where I've been there. And the whole first week is spent trying to get the actor to stop being funny, um, which is hard because you cast these brilliant comedians, right? Because they have to understand timing. They have to know how to stop when people laugh and have to know how to let, you know, make sure everything's heard. They have to understand the constantly changing pace of comedy. Um, my plays are night and day different if it's a white audience or people of color, night and day. Um, and so you have to have, you know, good comedy actors that know how to listen and 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 pause and respond to the laugh and keep going and push through when they need to. But then you also get them in the room and you have to say, okay, now you need to just be a real person and believe this because these people are in real situations. And they really, if, if you don't, as a character, you know, we all believe in ourselves. We believe what we believe and we think that we're right. And if they don't have that same process in the room, I, I Seriously, every time, first week is just trying to get them to just be actors, you know, believe in your character, you know, endow them with like the reasons they believe in themselves. Because like what Tori was talking about, if, if they don't 100% believe it and go for it and, and trust that that's like what their character will live and die for, it's not going to be funny at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, a lot of it's just, and I just pick good collaborators, to, good directors, not every director, it's other thing I've learned, not every director can direct comedy. It's a real science. Um, such a science. I'm, I've had so many uh, readings of the Thanksgiving play that were horrifically bad and not funny at all. And it was oh, all no. the director. Yeah, and it was clearly, I mean, not that, you know, everything I write is funny, but it, it's been proven to be pretty funny. And so, you know, I, I was like, wow. But I could see the director like doing these things to just kill jokes, kill jokes, kill jokes. And and it, it's a real science. Um, when I were, I, the reason I worked with Maurice von Stupenagel in New York on that on the Thanksgiving play was because I was told he's a comedy machine. Um, and I was like, great, that's what I need. I need a comedy machine to come in. And and I do lots of um, I do lots of building jokes. I do three joke setups. So there's two jokes, and then the third one is the joke. And, and people have to understand how to build that. If you hit every one, it's just exhausting, and no one can hear anything, and it takes forever, and the play's ten hours long. You know, you have to know how which jokes to last through, how to build it, how to hit the peak, peak joke, how to hit the joke. Now there's maybe a small joke that's gonna come back in 10 pages. You know, you have to understand all of that. And you need someone who is such a strong um, calibrator of every single moment. I mean, Ritz is, I will say Ritz is, I mean, I worked with a lot of fantastic comedy directors, but I was just, he's on my mind because Mike's sitting there in my screen. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think, you know, like literally getting down to like beat by beat, like, no, 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 this beat has to move, always has to move like this. And this beat always, ha you have to like get through this word and get, th you know, and it's just, it's so calibrated perfectly and it can't change. You have to listen to the audience, but yet at the same time, you can't change the rhythm of the jokes and the rhythm of what's important and all that. And I don't know if I answered anything. No, you did, I mean, because it's crap. Now. I just, I just drank a Coke Zero. I'm a little- Get it girl, get it. <laughs> Um, I mean, I do think that certainly all of us, I'm sure, have experienced that the like worst version of the comedy where it's just flat and slow and serious. And it's like, I would rather die. Oh my God. Um, but, but the, the, and then when it's proven done well, it is like this muscular craft that these actors have to have, this athleticism of language to know this syllable is funnier than this syllable. So like punch this, hit the consonant. And then the big large scale, the macro ideas of how the comedy flows and how you have to start this character in scene one here so that in scene 10, we can have them turn around the corner and we're like, oh, I totally know what they're thinking or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's the macro, the micro, and it, it's, I will always cast a comedy actor in anything, especially drama, because I know that they're actually frankly better actors. <laughs> they can have that, that, that detailed, detailed, work that they know how to to turn on and off and and so anyway it's like if you're funny I know that you can do anything if you're serious I'm like yeah. can, can you do anything <laughs> well, comedy actors are consistent yes like they know how to hit it every night you know yeah, and not drop point. it and not you know that's amazing it's an amazing skill if you change it you might ruin it yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tori well what's your experience with kind of great directors actors like how do you get how do you get the comedy kind of from the page and your idea to to their bodies yeah i will say that um when larissa was talking about uh directors the director that came to my mind is, as far as like precision and um repetition is margot borlo she's very like i had a chance to work with her in grad school and she was just very much like she she will write down like like you said about the script like every beat of it and she made sure that like 
she's a drill sergeant in the rehearsal room and she's just like this is how it should go and it should feel like muscle memory to you and so like let's take it from the top let's take it from the top like she's got that and I have a very like I come from a sports background and so for me it's like working with her is like a dream come true in this space because you're just running drills <laughs> over and over until everybody feels comfortable and I think the way she makes actors feel like every night when you're going out there, you know exactly what you're supposed to do. You know exactly where you, you're supposed to be. And like the audience is there to to experience what you're offering and like don't let them shake you or give you too many applause that you like forget the rhythm. You know what I mean? She gets that like sort of energy into the actors. And so like, I think of her as like a, 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 a director who really knows comedy and knows how to make sure that, that there's some sort of um, continuity every night with with the the shows um and I'll also say that like for my professional career I've been really blessed to be able to work with a lot of actors who I grew with in grad school and mm -hmm. who have been like worked on you know my one act plays and my school projects here and there and, and so you, every time like when we've gotten to the professional world they're like mm, I know what Tori's ask, asking I know what she wants I know the rhythm like I know her musicality and that's been really helpful especially in like short rehearsal periods like at, at Playwrights Horizons the rehearsal period is sh so short and you use that um you use the uh the preview process a lot for like rehearsals which is like very cool and also very frightening and to have like some actors that you work with in the past and that like sort of know you as a comedic writer and know your um your your quirks that's been that's been super helpful and they're and I will agree about working with funny actors and comedic actors because then you know that they can do drama, um, but that they they love the the funny. You want actors who love the funny and who aren't like after the tears, because then that's a whole other situation when 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 people have to cry. So you know, there's that. Yeah, they have to love the funny. That's so that's yeah. a great way of saying it. And it's true. Like once I find the actors that get it, I will never let them go. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. They're the first people, no, no, sorry, just these people. <laughs> and I mean, I would say just since we're, I think we should all name great um, directors of comedy. I was thinking of Meredith McDonough and Sean Daniels as two of my comic, like I can just trust that they're gonna, they're gonna get it. Mike, do you wanna talk a little bit about directors since you and Larissa were sharing one, but, but what, how do you kind of like work with them to, to, to make the, the music and to, to go off of what Tori was just saying about musicality, which you brought up first, that rhythm and stuff. Um. I, I have uh, been lucky to work with Maritz on nearly all of my plays and we uh, came up as interns together and um, he just uh, he really gets like uh, what I'm trying to do and and he works like a motherfucker and he, like, he works so hard and then like he makes me like I used to want to work a lot and then I got a little bit lazy and he kept making me so it's good that he like keeps me on that but um, and he's very precise and um, uh, but I'm thinking about like uh, just sort of, you know, this this rhythm question a little bit. Like, I think that um, it applies uh, not not just to like individual scenes, but also to sort of like the overall rhythm of a process and being receptive to that. Um, and how like it's funny to me that like as I see rehearsal processes, that like the first week is like really fun because people are having a lot of like they're on on book and uh, really enjoying the language, and then like the second week kind of sucks because like people push too hard and they're like. <laughs> like trying to capture that you know like um I guess what I'm saying is that processes also have a rhythm and that like um and I've been kind of attuned to that lately and that like first preview like first couple previews is like tough because people are learning kind of how the audience is going to respond and then um and then people chill out and they figure out like kind of like what the like break points are and like where the audience like wants a breath and where you should push through and you know what I mean so I think that like having collaborators that are really receptive to that and that um are hearing the audience, but also leading them and not letting the audience dictate like where the stops are, but like uh, like receptive to sort of what the energy is. Like, um, I don't know, Tori was mentioning about like athletics and I think that it's actually like, I, I used to be a, this really slow cross country runner and like you could you could tell like when a race started like, oh, I, I went out too fast or like, oh, like I'm like really nervous or, you know, like, or oh, I, um, I, I took this too leisurely, you know what I mean? And so I think that there is like a rhythm to processes too that, um, yeah, that, uh, my uh, strongest collaborators are, are receptive to. Mike, do you do you give the note faster, funnier, or do you not? <laughs> I try not to. Like, really, um, I uh, 
if I feel like there's like um like not all of the juice is being squeezed out of the orange, then I might like give a little um gesture towards that. But like mostly, I try to let um, people discover it themselves um, and just like ask that they be truthful. But like one of my biggest actual like sort of notes is not faster, but to um, hit uh, to punch line endings. Um, mm, that's a good I, one. Because I, um, I I often backload a line if there's any information that you need to hear because if there's a lot of laughter they might not catch the beginning of a line, so there's not as much like story critical information in the front of a line and also like because you're doing a relay with your scene partner you have to hit the end of your line so that your scene partner knows to start. Yeah, that's great. I always talk about cue pickup. It's less about like saying the line fast, it's picking up the cue, which is a similar, like making sure that both of them are really clear. But I'm, yeah. I'm the jerk that's always like, faster, funnier, faster, funnier. <laughs> I really try hard to resist because it's like, I, I would get in there and, you know, like I would, yeah. I, would I get hate myself for doing it, but I do it every single time. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can I, can I just say real quick on that? What yeah. I do is I do the Hey guys, I'm just trying to figure out the scene. Could you just read it straight through? Like, don't pause, don't just go straight through for me so I can figure out the words. And then they're all like, oh my God, that was so funny. We're so good. I'm like, oh wow, well, whatever. Oh. I don't know. I'm just I'm just figuring out the words. <laughs> my God, that's genius. <laughs> just just a quick line through, just a quick one, just just a speed through, guys. Um, Leah, would you talk about your relationship with with directors? Like what's worked really well for you, or and like who's your who's your comic director of choice? Um, I do not have a comic director of choice, oh. but I, uh, I'm always looking. I also recently worked with Moritz. <laughs> He's great. Uh, but, um, you know, like Two, Two Mile Hollow specifically hasn't been produced in New York, um, but I, it has had nine productions um, regionally. And um, the world premiere was like a simultaneous world premiere with four theaters of color. Uh, around the country and I didn't know any of these directors <laughs> and many of the processes um, I would just go in for like 10 days uh, and then have two previews again these are like small theaters of color for the most part so it's not like a whole like uh, four week long three week long preview process it's just like we rehearse it two previews it opens <laughs> right and um, I because like that was initially so nerve-wracking for me I did write out extremely concise like playwright notes uh before the script because for me and I think for most of comedy like tone is just a play killer so like for me like I I just really honed it in um to every single potential collaborator or or a collaborator that I didn't know that you had to strip the actors down first like the first week of rehearsal has to be completely stripped down like make them act like they are in a completely naturalistic play and then you can start having fun. But then by the time I would come in, like they would be so scared of overdoing it that there was so much room to play. <laughs> and um, for me, like I love actors who, like, like comedy actors are amazing, but um, consistency is the most important. You don't have to be a stand-up comedian as long as you can like fully commit and live in the world. And I think as writers of comedy, we do ask a lot of our collaborators, like we ask our actors to do the craziest shit ever. And like our directors, like we get all angry if people aren't laughing. I mean, I don't, but you know, you know, like they, they always think they're like, that we're mad at them if it doesn't go well, you know, and like- I just get sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, there, there's just like a little bit more pressure for output from like audience reaction. So like above all, I'm just looking for like consistency and kindness. And mm. um, Lily Tongue Crystal is a great example of somebody who um, I think I was only able to be at like seven or eight rehearsals and she just called me every day and was just like, um, is this okay? Like, like this is what's happening um, tonally, is this correct? And I'd be like, I mean, it sounds okay. There's no way for me to know until I get there. But yeah, kindness above all, like I think, especially in a comedy room, you have to work with a director who creates a warm, safe environment for the actors. The actors get a Such little a bit more note. slack, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Drill sergeant <laughs> plus really, really nice. A really nice drill sergeant. <laughs> yeah. Or or at least can create the illusion that they're nice illusion. in front of me. Yeah. There we go. 
it's all illusion. <laughs> it's such a great thing about tone. How do you how do you convey tone? Like, did you use examples? It's like this kind of a thing, or like it's like this play, but bigger. Like, how do you? It's like such a nebulous thing to try to describe on the page. How do you do it? Um, it took me a really long time to understand how to talk about my own tone um, when I'm not writing. And even when I think I'm writing in, a, in, nat in naturalism, I think it's maybe a hair or two above just because I use a lot of monologues and music. But um, in terms of like my comedies and satirical play, uh, it took me, like I used to direct all of my own work, full disclosure, in all of my 20s, I had a collaborative theater company and I come from that background. So like when I switched over to um, like having other people direct my plays, like it took me a long time to like, uh, take a take take a front seat as a playwright because I was like oh you're the director you do whatever you want and then I saw like a lot of my work being tanked so I was like I have to learn how to talk about like how my work fails and for me um, like through trial and error like me, like a lot of trial and error um, I learned that my work fails when actors lean into any irony at all and I stole this phrase actually from Young Jean Lee, who's also very, very funny. Um, like uh, she, she, she wrote like, every, everyone is sincere and means everything they says, they say. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that just means like, that just means that. And I tried doing that in quite work for my work because, but, but, but then I just morphed it into everybody is earnest. Everybody is grounded. And then yeah. it just opened that like, that opens up a lot of room to play, I think. Cause it's also this thing of like sometimes a great play doesn't need the actor's help to make it funny. Like the funny is there. They need to yeah. be exactly what you're saying. Earnest, honest, authentic, really true to that character. Because if they're like, I'm going to help this joke sing, you're like, no, no, no. And that's dead. Now you killed it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that once they have, because like a lot of comedy actors, like initially forget that they're actually playing characters, like mm -hmm. that they have to get to know in their bones. And then like, any great actor once they do have it in their bones like then they can like play with a joke but like they have to get level one down first so that's amazing because your play I would have never guessed that you started in naturalism but for for two mile hollow because it like it goes so big and so amazingly like yeah <laughs> orchestrally hilarious <laughs> yeah like, like that was like, added on later yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it makes great sense and it makes it like even more true of it so Jonathan tell us about your experience with directors like what's really worked um yeah how does how did Eureka Day kind of that experience go for you yeah I mean I've yeah I've had a chance to to work with um, some really good comedy directors, but I, I think it's definitely something I'm still trying to to understand. Um, and I feel like the the note I give the most when I if I like come into a process that I haven't been a part of the whole time is just I I write with a lot of line breaks, which is maybe my way of trying to be controlling about the rhythm. Um, and Usually when something's not working, it's because an actor is like blowing through the line breaks. And then, so that's like the note is just like, you know, use the text as- Do what as I said. The stage. Yeah, and then, and then when they do it works. And, um, but I, I think uh, it's still, I mean, I, I actually, be, I mean, if I can sort of throw a question out to everybody, I, I, I think something I'm really trying to figure out and I, and I don't, I haven't found an answer is like when you're, how you determine from a conversation, if it's possible with a director, like if, because directing comedy is such a technical thing. And when you see people who have that skill and they just know like, oh, this person needs to turn out, you know, a half so that we can see their reaction so that this joke, like, like that stuff, um, how you get that from like the coffee you have with a director to, to sort of get like how you determine if they're the kind of person who has that, that the that's those skills and, the, and that those instincts. And I have not, figured out how to determine that. I mean, people can talk really articulately about the themes of a play or the ideas or, or sort of what it sparks in them. But this whole, this other thing, which is that like very technical comedy skill, I, I, I haven't figured out how to suss that out when having conversations with people about a play. So I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has any insight. How do y'all do it? Any ideas? I mean, I think the reason Moritz is so popular on this uh, phone call specifically is because he has a body of work that you can look back at and be like oh he's good with comedy like and he's just like a arbitrary not arbitrary but he's he's just like a specific example but I think 
um, like I've heard a lot about Margot too, just the same thing Tori was saying that she's very precise and musical and I, but I don't know other than that, like a word of mouth, it's really hard to find directors who are good with comedy. <laughs> who are you? And call us, like, call us all. You're, yeah, I feel right? like you're asking something that's like, like so, um, hard and and intimate because it's not just about like comedy right like I mean it's like who's going to be an interpreter of your work and like there's all these coffee setups and and it doesn't really tell you like I, I wish that there were some kind of shortcut but I feel like it's uh a lot of us get um shotgun married anyhow like so it's like you learn by <laughs> you learn by it either succeeding or tanking right and then but then there's also just sort of like seeing their productions and seeing like what they've done before like a lot of times if a director hasn't done much new work that's like a flag for me um another flag is when they say i have no questions like i've i've, I've had multiple like i have no questions about this and then it's just like kablam. <laughs> like so i don't have the like shortcut to getting a good result but i do have some shortcuts for getting a bad result <laughs> yeah mostly for me i just talk to a lot of people i mean I, I talk i do a lot of research on people um, personally, like anytime I meet with a director, I've talked to everybody you've ever worked with, <laughs> you know, afterwards, if we gel just personally, then I, if I haven't seen their work, which since I'm not in a New York playwright often, you know, I haven't seen a lot of these folks. So um, it, it's, yeah, so I, I just talk, I literally go through their resume and I just call people, call people, call people and say, hey, what are they, is it funny? Was it funny? Did it work? Is it, you know, and I just go through every comedy they've done. And if they haven't done comedy, I honestly, at this point, I'm just, I'm not, I don't feel like I have an ex experience and skill to hire someone who hasn't. So unfortunately I won't be giving anyone their first chance. <laughs> someone will, I hope, but that's not gonna be me. Um, Cause I just need, I need people to be funny. I don't know how to fix it myself yet. So if the director doesn't know how, I don't know how to. I mean, I is it okay to like talk technically? I mean, I, I think sometimes I can just get to the point and being like, let's talk about how this scene, this scene, this first scene, how does it work? Where's the first joke? How do you as a director work with the how do you make the room feel welcome? How do you, you know, I mean, the, I feel like the folks who can't jump in and talk process and details, that's not my people anyway, even if that's like one of my more serious plays. It's like, no, let's talk like practical. H how, how do you tell them to go, go, go? <laughs> you know, how, how do you tell them to, to, you know, like, like we were saying, how do you find the authentic, but also keep the comedy rolling and I don't know. I feel like I, I could have, I've had some coffees that can get that deep that quickly. And if they're kind of not prepared for that conversation or don't have that in their vocabulary, that's a pretty big red flag to go. I'm not sure if we're going to speak the same language, at least speak it quick enough <laughs> in a play process. Right. And the other, I mean, the other thing I've been thinking about a lot and, and I mean, I sort of speaking to what Leah was saying about is like what you put in the text is when you, you know, if you've been lucky enough to see a play have four or five, six productions, like there are certain things you just know about how the play works and like what and uh, and how you transmit sort of that information to a director because some of it's some of it's very technical and very small and it's really like about how this moment works but that this is the only way for that moment to work like it has to do this thing um, and how much of that do you kind of put in the play text when you're publishing it and and how much do you just sort of like trust that people will find it on their own. And maybe we can kind of use the last 15 minutes because we've already done chatted for so long um, to, to talk about some like practical stuff for writers and any directors watching out there kind of um, <clears throat> it occurs to me that there are we kind of can't say it enough, especially to younger writers kind of getting started in this field to know your own work first and trust that you know it best it doesn't mean you can't learn from actors you can't learn from a great question by a dramaturg or a conversation with a director but the answer is in you as to if this is how it goes. And it feels like, especially with comedy, it's easy for a young writer to kind of be swept away from their own story at, at, a, at a certain point and kind of being able to say, you know what's funny. And if it's funny to you, that actually can be the answer. That can be like, nope, because it's funny to me <laughs> that you don't actually have to adjust. And I mean, you can't, again, find the right collaborators, but there's a reason why you wrote this the way that you did and trying to make sure that especially young writers can get that message that, it's yours. You you wrote it. You you made this thing, and so you have an answer to how to how to make it funny. Um, are there other kind of practical things that you would want to tell people coming into this field, writing their first comedy, going, "Is this funny? Am I funny? How do I know? How do I find the right collaborators?" I mean, what's the kind of? I know we always get the like, "What advice would you have for young people?" But um, 
what's your what's your kind of download for for young folks or I, I would say for, especially for people of color that um, it's okay if the white people don't get the joke. <laughs> it's fine. They, they don't have to. Um, I have plenty of jokes that, you know, I go through my, I, I, I don't, the Thanksgiving play is all people that can present as white. So that not, they're not necessarily all white, but they, they present as white. So it tends to be a pretty white room. Um, and every rehearsal process, like, I don't get this joke. It's not working. It's like, it's not for you. Don't worry about it. When the natives show up, you trust me, they're going to find think it's funny. And then the first audience, I'm like, oh, look, there's there's the native person. There's a native, you know, I know exactly where they are in the audience and it's for them. And that's OK. And I, I, I just was dealing with this with a young writer just this week again. Like, well, I keep getting this feedback that they don't get this. They don't get that. They don't think it's, and it's like it doesn't matter. It's OK. They don't have to get it. Everything is not for the white people. Like, it's OK. And Thanksgiving play is specifically for the white people. It's to try to get them to do change. Right. And, um, but they don't get, they don't get everything. And that's great. They don't, they're not, they don't. It, and, and that's hard for some white folks, for sure. They're used to getting everything um, and everything is for them. Um, and everything is not for them in my plays and that's okay. And I think that's something, especially young writers, they're constantly like, oh, well I have to change in the schools. Oh my, I never went to schools. So I don't know, I've never taken a writing class. I don't know what they tell you, but I get writer, native writers coming to me constantly being like, well, they said I have to change this, and I can, they can't talk like that, and, th and all these things that, that make them indigenous. They're specific to their community. I was like, you've got just, I don't know what you got to do to get the grade, but you just forget all that. That's all bullshit. Um, you do whatever you want. It's your show, you know, and you write your people your way, and the white people don't have to understand, but endlessly, especially from grad students, I get that endlessly. They're trying to bang all the color out of people, and I don't know why I've never been. Tori, what do you, uh, what's your kind of, your, your advice for, for folks? Such a loaded question. <laughs> it's like, I'm thinking of like, I agree with Larissa saying about like, you know, the jokes for your community and like making sure that you, um, that you're continuing to write for yourself. I think like, like uh, Sarah Wu always says like, this, like, does like this lesson on like the gift play and like write your play for one person, for the audience of one, even if, if that's you, if that's your mom, if that's your best friend from kindergarten and like just focus on that audience and nobody else. And like, let that be your first draft and let it be your second or third. Let it be how many drafts you need it to be until you want to show it to other people and you're ready to open like your mind and your heart to, you know, the questions about does this work? Is it producible? I mean, that's a whole other level of being a playwright. Like we, we don't make a lot of money in this business, so you have to love it. So you need to love the process of it. You need to love sitting in front of your computer and dreaming of these worlds and creating these characters and loving them and spending years with them. And then if you want to move forward past that, you do have to start thinking about, you know, producible work and and, and certain playhouses and, and, and that uh, certain audiences, right? And that's like, that's a whole other monster of a thing. And I think for like writers of color, it's a specific um, navigation that you have to have about like knowing that the mass uh, majority of dramaturgs and artistic directors um, that are receiving your plays and your submissions are going to be white people. And the only way it's going to get past them onto the next desk is if, if it's some, if you translate something in your play for their ears and their eyes and their hearts. And that's like a whole other, you know, monster of a game to figure out like, how do I embed my culture and like, and how does the foundation of this my culture and how do I embed things that like white people understand that may stay in the play, may not stay in the play by the time you get your first audience, be strategic about it. But like, if you want to be produced there, there are things that like playwrights of color have to contend with that like white playwrights don't have to. And so my advice specifically to playwrights of color is like, do you at all times start off with that audience of one and then from there, we'll start talking about the technical stuff, you know, and, and being producible, but it's important. You won't get to that point if you start erasing your voice at the very beginning. And so, mm. yeah, it's a lot of advice. It's a lot of strategy and stuff that goes involved, it, that's involved in it. But I, I, you know, I think the beginning of it is just like uh, protecting your voice, protecting who you write for, and then moving forward to all the stuff that will have to happen after that. Mike, what's your thought about that? About uh, about Ad advice ishness. I don't know. Gen general, maybe somewhat helpful things to writers. <laughs> um, 
or not. You could just tell us what you're going to have for dinner. That's fine, too. No, uh, I think uh, start out by writing short plays. Like, um, like I did a lot of 10-minute plays starting out, and I think that that helped me to nail down my style because it's like a it's just like uh like a low stakes sort of like uh like um way to f just figure out like like a movement and then um and then like while you're sort of chiseling away at your full length stuff it's like you're you're just working things out like but um and then i also think um you have to like read a lot of other people's plays and steal their shit like um and um i think that uh you have to figure out how to like um cultivate your um rehearsal persona like however that is but like i i think that i like um was mistaken in thinking that like oh if i like write the perfect draft it'll speak for itself and then like people will do it but like there's this whole other component of like being in the room and translating your blueprint so there you know what i mean so i think that like getting in as many processes as you can whether it's uh, through readings or through 10 minute play fest where you're like working on that skill of like how do i impart this vision to others is, is just like a whole different component that I thought like didn't exist, but does. Awesome. All right, Leah and Jonathan, Leah, would you go first? What, what wisdom can you bestow? Yeah, um, I think, sorry, my, my uh, fiance came in, the room, he didn't know I was on the Zoom. Um, uh, I think that there's a vast difference between like actual comedy and like theater funny and like a lot of like theater funny the stakes really is just like so like like it's like very academic and like you could just be like oh my god two people are wearing hats and then like all these old people will be like ha 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 and like you know just like I think I think challenge yourself to try to be better than that just you know like like a like if you can move past your own pain and like hurt like uh and injustice through comedy and make yourself feel better by seeing all of this turmoil through a different lens then i think that you've you're on your way to accomplishing something and you will probably touch other people through your humor and um, I saw this really unintentionally funny tweet the other day. I, I forgot who it was, but it was a playwright. And it was something like, oh, it must be such a burden to think you're so funny. And it's like, it's it's not though. Like it's a burden to think you're a genius. So like, like when you, when you write from a comedic uh, lens, just remember that you can really do whatever you want especially in theater, you can be as crazy as you want, at least like in your first drafts, you know, because we're not as respected as drama writers anyway. <laughs> like, just, just blow it up, like, like, like do it for you and just start there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Jonathan, we'll end with you. And then I'm gonna try to um, just prep you all to tell people how to experience your stuff right now in whatever ways there are. So Jonathan, advice first, and then we'll like plug, um, plug our shit. Yeah, I mean, I, I I guess I would say that the sort of, the ballast to like the lack of respect is that theaters want to produce comedies. So maybe you don't get the get the respect, but you do get the production, so <laughs> that's something. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, advice is just like, you know, reading a lot of plays and seeing a lot of plays and and because part of what you're doing is you're honing your own taste and sort of that's like a thing that moves in parallel to honing your voice and you're sort of trying to get those things I think as as close together as they can without probably ever being able to actually have them fully meet um and then just sort of writing to you know for for yourself as your first audience and to to amuse yourself and I think and Washburn has says a thing about like write try and write the play that only you and no one else would like um, as a sort of, you know, sort of. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you. This is amazing. Thanks for making me laugh and making me think. And um, it's so nice to virtually meet some of you um, for the first time in this weird way because life is weird right now. But um, um, I, I will tell you the stuff that I know about. Mike, your show is streaming. Teenage Dick is streaming right now. How do you find that? 
um, it's being produced by Theater Wit, so you can uh, Google that and um, hop on there. Awesome. And then, Leah, I know your Nevada Tan is on Audible. Is there other stuff that we can of yours that we can enjoy in this virtual time? Nope. Nope. Just that. <laughs> Just that amazing, awesome play. Please go check it out on Audible, Nevada Tan. Jonathan, are you streaming things? What's what? What are you doing? Uh, not right. I have some workshops coming up, like these development things that have said they're gonna stream them, like play uh, something at Playpen. Great. This is gonna stream. And, we'll keep an uh, eye on that. So we'll see. Yeah, they do that. And you can you know buy all of our plays in some fashion and read them in some way too. Um, uh, Larissa, do you have anything listenable or watchable at the moment? No, I don't do streaming. No. Nope. <laughs> No, I kind I of thought that play, about you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, whatever. Um, now, Thanksgiving play is going to be coming up, though, at a bunch of, I was like in 20 cities this year, instead of like another 10 next year. So you'll find it somewhere. Once it's one out. of the most popular plays in America right now. Thank goodness, because it is Yay. genius and amazing. <laughs> um, Tori, how can we engage with your work at the moment? Um, I don't have anything streaming right now. I did have a show on play per view. And depending on how long we're doing this, <laughs> I might go back to play per view for another show. Awesome. Um, but it was cool. It was a, it was a great experience. I think anybody who wants to, um, they they're doing like this initiative where not only do you get to have a play reading that um, streams nationally, but also the proceeds get to go to um, a charity of the playwrights choosing. So that's really cool. Um, and so we were able to help a woman shelter in New York. And so that was really cool. So if anybody's in, oh, that's the, you know, in the need for wanting to watch theater um, and be donating to to folks in need, then I suggest play per view. Play for view. All right. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you all. You're fabulous. I hope you have good drinks and good food after this in some quantity and period. Um, and I can't wait to give you like high fives and hugs in real life and one, you know, post